Okay, everybody, welcome back. We are on lecture four now, which is must pretreatments. So now that we've harvested our grapes, what different kinds of treatments can we utilize? So before we get started, I just want to go over some definitions. This will make the rest of the lecture a lot easier. Um, and also, it's just nice that you have it in writing, so that way you know um, what I'm talking about, and when we can just go forward from there. So must is freshly crushed fruit juice that contains the skin, seeds, and sometimes the stems of the fruit. Tannin um, is extracted from seeds and skins of grapes. It's crucial in the longevity of a wine's shelf life, and it gives the, the drying mouth sensation when drinking a lot of red wine. So something is like really heavy and tannin has that drying sensation in your mouth. Um, and finally, we have maceration, and this is a process used mostly in making red wine, which involves steeping the grape skins and solids in wine uh, after fermentation when alcohol acts as a solvent to extract color, tannins, and aroma from the skin. This is aided by um, heat, the amount of skin contact, and time. Then there's also cold maceration, which is... Um, which takes place before the fermentation, which we're going to talk about today, where the skins are just in contact with the juice um, in a chilled environment. It's a different type of extraction. So um, you can just think of maceration as, um, you know, extracting from the skin, basically, and then the skin start to soften up from there. So you can think of it that way. But you'll hear that a lot in the winemaking world. So, yes. Okay, so this is our outline our uh, overview for must pretreatment, uh, must prima fermentation treatments, excuse me. <clears throat> so we might have to divvy this up into two different lectures. Um, maybe not, we'll see. It is a lot of information. Um, it's pretty straightforward. It's just um, a lot of information if you've never seen it before. So part one, we're going to talk about cluster and berry sorting. It's pretty straightforward. Um, crushing and destemming and direct to press processes. And then part two, we're going to talk about grape freezing, um, uh, cryo concentration and cryo extraction, very similar process, withering, cold soak, thermovinification, and saignée. So these are all processes that are done before fermentation. And this is, um, you know, just like we talked about with where all the flavors and aromas come from in wine. So these are the, the treatments that we choose to do to the must to get a resulting you know, flavor or style in a wine afterwards. So these are really crucial in determining what you're going to get at the end. These are all choices that a winemaker would have to make. So um, let's go on to cluster and berry sorting. So this can be done in the vineyard or at the winery. Um, you go out into the vineyard and just like you can see in this photo right here, um, people are picking the grapes and they're tossing it in these really large bins. Well, what they can do is um, normally there's someone at the bin and they pull out all the leaves or any, um, you know, mog material other than grapes that they might find um, in there. And typically when things are harvested by hand, typically it's a pretty clean pick um, unless the leaves are dying already. And then they get all um, crusty and crumbly and they kind of just break into the buckets and stuff. And that's hard to avoid. But for the most part, people try to avoid getting a lot of um, leaves and, and uh, other matter in, in it for that case. Uh, another way to do it is by hand at sorting tables. So just like these guys right here. So um, what would happen is the grapes would get picked, you know, out in the vineyard just the same. But they would come into this belt, this large conveyor belt that's poured slowly onto this belt. And it kind of spreads it all out. So that way you can sift through it very nicely. And this, this is also important not just for, um, you know, leaves and stems. But also because, you know, if you're having a bad year for crop and you have like mildew or mold and some clusters just kind of look gross and they're going to impart bad flavors it's a really good way to you know instill quality control for your grapes so people have the sorting tables this is a job a job that a lot of interns have at larger facilities they go in there and you just look through every cluster as it's going by and you just pick out the bad ones and you just throw them out it's it's really wonderful for helping out the wine quality uh, and then last but not least, we have um, machine optical sorting, and this is really fantastic. I have a slide on it here for you guys. So very expensive equipment, of course, but what, basically what would happen is the grapes get brought in from the vineyard, and it gets, here's my mouse, um, it gets dumped into this chute right here 
where it goes into an in- infeed conveyor, then um, a camera is able to detect, you know, the rejects from that, whether it's unripe berries or a leaf or, you know, some other kind of unwanted um, specimen there. And then what happens is these air jets are actually synchronized with the camera and it just like shoots a tuft of air right at that position and it pushes the rejects into its own bin. And then all of the desired outputs go into this product outflow, which, you know, then goes on to further processing down the line. So very expensive, like I said, um, but very cool technology. There's a lot of stuff coming out in the wine industry like this that are really top of the line. Um, you know, research has gone into this, all this machinery. There's even um, optical cameras for vineyards that can help quantify vineyard yields. So this machine will like drive through your vineyard and calculate how many tons you're going to produce um, based off of, you know, what the camera counts with the sen- sensors and approximates the weight of each cluster. And it's a whole thing, but very cool, very cool technology. So lots to look into if you're into that. Okay, next we have crushing and destemming. Um, so the stepper, st- <laughs> crusher destemmer, excuse me, getting tongue tied tonight. Um, that is exactly what it is. You bring in the clusters, and it's a machine that removes the berries from the stems, and it will crush the grapes. So um, the different styles of wine can be utilized with this machine. So, and that all has to do with the percentage of intact berries. So the um, level of crushing that you choose really has an impact on the wine and the flavors and aromas that are going to be produced at the end. So um, firstly, how this machine works is, yeah, you dump the clusters into the back of the drum. And then there are these paddles that rotate inside of the cylinder so here are the paddles it's in the cylinder and it might be a little hard to see this photo but there's a bunch of um, holes all around this cylinder so what happens is the paddles are turning and turning and what it's doing it's actually pushing the um, cluster up against those holes and the berries are removed and the stem is left behind and then the stem comes out of this kind of garbage chute back here all back here um, and then the berries come down and then they are crushed. So it's first destemmed and then the berries are crushed. And you can actually adjust these rollers. They kind of like, it kind of look like knuckles that roll together and you can um, spread them apart. So you can have less crushing or you can put them close together and you can have maximum crushing of the grapes. And what results from that is though, if you have lots of whole berries, so minimum crushing, you'll have a slower fermentation and it'll actually make the wine more fruity because it's slowly releasing sugars into the wine. Um, it's fermenting slower so you're not blowing off as much aroma and character from the mus. But if you have uh, more crushed berries, you'll have a faster fermentation because all of the sugar is um, exposed and ready for the yeast to consume. And in turn, you'll have more heat produced. Um, heat is one of the... Um, one of the factors of what's included in the fermentation, um, the more sugar and the yeast available will produce heat and carbon dioxide. Um, you'll also get more color extraction. So it's almost like uh, brewing a tea bag where you um, put tea in, you know, kind of lukewarm water and it kind of extracts a little bit. It's kind of weak. And then you put, uh, the, you know, the same tea, but different tea bag in a really hot cup of water. And then you would, you know, brew your cup of tea a lot faster obviously so that's kind of a way to remember it I kind of revert to tea because I'm a big tea drinker um but whatever works for you is um totally fine so just to kind of help you out there okay so what is the purpose of a crusher destemmer it's to help get better extraction of the juice um better maceration of the skin so like we're saying the skin contact It helps to have some of the berries broken so you get that color and you can um, get that extraction. It's also an opportunity opportunity to remove the stems and the rachis. Rachis is just basically the stem off the stem. That's like the really tiny stem that almost attaches to the grape. So that's just a little fun vocabulary word for you. But yeah, that's the purpose. Nothing crazy. Um, So yeah. Then there's different types of crushers. So there's a crusher destemmer, which we just talked about. So this separates the berries from the stems and crushes the fruit. 
Um, it's wanted when the stems can impart negative flavors. So if the stems are really green and um, they have some kind of bitter components, you'll definitely want those removed. But there's also a crusher stem disintegrator, which is exactly as, as it sounds, and that breaks up the stems with the berries. And this is wanted when stems impart positive character. So if the stems are brown and um, they're kind of woody and they can kind of get that like tea-like flavor going on, then if that's something you're going for, it's definitely the equipment you're going to want to use. So there you go. Okay. Pressing. What's the purpose of pressing? It's to recover juice or wine associated with the pulp skins and seeds that isn't released by the free run. Um, you can also separate different press fractions to manipulate the juice and wine composition. And we're going to talk about this in the next couple of slides. But, you know, basically, um, if you have, if you bring in white grapes and you send it direct to press, you're removing it from the skin so you don't get any skin contact. And you're basically left with this juice that you ferment and turn into white wine. For um, reds, you press after the fermentation, of course. But for the press fractions, you can manipulate the composition of the juice or wine, depending on how hard you press. So the um, you know, the free run, you know, is, is what comes off without any pressure applied. And then the more that you press, you get juice extraction, but then you also start to crush the seeds and the skins. And there are tannins in there and even the stems sometimes too, if you're doing a um, whole cluster. And the harder you press with that, the more bitter and tannic components that you can extract from it. So again, another tea example, if you leave the tea bag in for too long or if you take the tea bag out and you squeeze it really hard against the side of the cup, you'll notice that the tea is a lot stronger or a lot more tannic and sometimes more bitter. So there's something there. There's a science there, I promise. <laughs> Definitely. Okay, so just more in what I just slightly covered uh, there's different types of presses in the wine industry. So there's batch presses, and that means that um, the pressing cycles can only be done in batches. So think of like if you're baking a batch of cookies, you can only cook a dozen cookies at a time. It's a batch. Whereas um, a, you know continuous means that it just has an even stream flow, and it's just continuously going through the lot. So um, if you work in a much larger facility, obviously the continuous might be ideal. Smaller facilities can handle... Um, batch presses but there's lots of different types of equipment out there so for the batch presses we have a basket press which is the this guy right here the wood one that's the very stereotypical uh, press that you see in a tasting room or you know in a history museum or something and this this is actually an, an automatic one that we see right here but typically what would happen is there is a handle that you turn at the top and then there's just a flat um, disc that just presses straight downward onto the grape skins to remove the juice or wine from it. Then we have the cylindrical press, which looks like a massive propane tank. Very beautiful, very beautiful, very expensive. Uh, and that is, we're going to talk more about that, but that presses the juice or the wine. It's collected into a pan and then uh, pumped into a tank. And for our continuous presses, we have a screw press, which there is a hopper, and a strainer, and it's basically a screw-like motion that um, you know compresses the load, and then the liquid is gathered, and then it's pumped out. Then there is a belt press, which is this guy over here, which looks really intimidating. And this is basically the, what I want you to get from this is a continuous flow. You know, the batch comes in, the grapes, the load comes in, and then it's you know feeded through this belt where it's then pressurized very harshly, and then the receiving container, it goes into from there. Uh, so there, um, <clears throat> excuse me, it looks like that's where the leftover pumice goes, and then it looks like the juice or wine is collected on the bottom again. So I haven't worked with one of those, but uh, it looks pretty intense. So pretty cool. Okay, direct to press. So uh, as I was talking about earlier, so this is obviously a pre-fermentation treatment, especially for white wines. It can be for some ros rosés, too. If you wanted to make a, a rosé from a red grape, you can set it direct to press, and it will extract some color still, but just not a lot, which is perfect because you're going for that blush color. So um, this can mi minimize extraction from the skin. Like I said earlier, the harder you press, the more extraction you get. So 
that's why that's in um, asterisks there. Uh, typically used for white and blush wines, and it can be used to reduce and manipulate varietal character. So, um, so yeah, that's that. This is a massive screw press, which is awesome. This is the top of the loading, what it looks like on the cylindrical press. And this is actually um, the inside. So this is called a uh, bladder press. This is the inside of the cylindrical press that you can see in this photo right here. This big propane tank looking thing. So yeah, this is the inside. And as you can see, half of it is um, it's like this bag that's been sucked into the side of the tank here. And on this other side, you see all these little tiny holes on this grate. So that's where the um, juices come out. So the bag inflates, actually, and it presses that load up against that metal grate, and it slowly squeezes it, and it extracts juices, and it's in the down, it'll, it would be in the downward position where all of those juices or wine would be collected in a pan and then pumped into a tank. So that's the, that's the science behind that. Um, different press fractions like I was talking about. So um, there's free run juice, which is no pressure added at all. And these are just approximations. I don't really think 50% of it is free run, but let's just say it is. Okay, this is just an example graph. Okay, then we have our first press fraction. So this is when, so they, they say they apply 0.2 bars of pressure. So then you get more, you know, get more volume, but it's a slightly different flavor, right? Because you've just started, decided to apply pressure. Now you're extracting um, some sugars and tannins from the skins just very slightly, but you're getting a lot more juice. And then we have a second press fraction, which has a maximum pressure at two bar. So obviously increasing the pressure a lot, you're getting way more extraction and that will have a lesser yield, but will add to your total. So as you can see, the more that we press, the less that we get, but um, you know you wouldn't get that total 100% if you just use free run. So even though, um, let's go to the next slide, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Even though free run juice is considered the highest quality of juice, um, you obviously cut your yield back if you were going to make a wine just based off of free run. So that's that'd be a really difficult decision to make. Do I wanna make more wine or is the free run gonna be so good that I can sell it for something that's worth it. You know, so that's another thing you have to think about with stuff like this. Some places do just take the free run. I know it sounds crazy, but some people, some places do. So that's a thing. Um, so yeah, press fractions after this are put into tiers based off of increasing pressure. That brings increasing bitterness for white wines. Uh, great pumice, that's what's the um, leftovers after pressing. So this... This actually might be a bad picture because this looks like they're just regular grapes, but just imagine super smushed grapes that are dry. That's basically pumice. That's pumice. That's what's left over. And most people just spread it back in their vineyards. Um, it's, you know, especially if it's coming from just a juice liquid, um, it's totally fine. It's not a big deal. The only thing that gets tricky is if you have pumice left over from an, a fermentation that still has alcohol on it. Alcohol is actually toxic to the vines. So you need to be really careful about spreading that in a vineyard. You need to make sure it's spread out really well and not super concentrated because it could be bad for your vineyard. Okay, let's talk about basket press. This is really ideal if you're doing a small volume of wine. Uh, otherwise, you're going to be there all day. Uh, you're going to have low yields, um, but this also has a low damage to the skins and seeds and minimal extraction. So the reason that this has a lower yield compared to the cylindrical press that I was just showing you guys is that this machine actually, when it inflates, so say it reaches that second stage, it'll actually deflate and rotate. So it mixes the load and then does it all over again. So that's, that's kind of the benefit of the cylindrical press. It maximizes um, your yield based off of your grapes, whereas the basket press is there's no way to um, mix that load I mean unless you were to physically open it up and take a really big spoon into it but that it would be so heavy it would that's not even practical it's not even possible um, so that's that's why but it, it is a you know very classic way of pressing it is something that you could um, talk about with the quality of wine potentially in a tasting room um, minimal extraction you know from the 
skins and the seeds so you're going to have a very smooth product um but it is difficult to get uniform pressing because that center section is not going to be as pressed as much as what's around the borders of course and it is extremely messy to clean so if you ever worked with winery equipment you'll know that 75 percent of winemaking is just cleaning up your own mess so if you're not into that that might not be for you but um get a good playlist and you can have a good time so it'll be good Okay, cylindrical press. Um, back to this. There's different types of cylindrical presses. So the one I just talked about was an air bladder previously, and that's what this photo was referring to because it's the bladder that fills with air and presses. There's also um, a piston and a vacuum press. Um, we're not going to really get into that. You don't need to know. Just know that they exist. Um, this, this is really nice equipment because it's easy to control the pressure uniformly. Um, elaborate pressing cycles and separation of juice lots possible. You have a moderate yield, but it is somewhat messy to clean. You do have to get in there and spray it out, and oftentimes you do get very wet and very messy. So that is that. Okay, yeah, and this is just a brief, um, you know, picture for you guys just to imagine. So. Piston presses come in from the sides and squeeze the grapes. Air bladder, that's the bag I just showed you, uh, flows in with air and then presses the grapes against the side of it. And then the, um, either way, the juice comes out into a pan and is collected. So that is how that works. Okay, screw press has a very high yield, but it also has high tissue damage. So lots of um, skin and seed getting in there um, lots of high solids in the juice because it's breaking up all those things a lot so you might have to do some kind of um, you know filtration or some kind of separation or you might just have to um, ferment with that in there in the juice so or you'll have to um, for the juice for the whites for reds you're just gonna have to filter it off or be okay with it for a while until you can get it separated um, this will also cause higher astringency of the wines, so um, definitely something to think about if you can afford that, or if you're dealing with a grape that can handle that astringency, then it's totally fine, but that is a consequence of using that equipment, so to be careful of that. Okay, pressing aids. So oftentimes, there are lots of different types of grape varieties that um, have a hard time pressing. They're either, um, you know, super pulpy or they're just, they're kind of um, slimy. The juice just doesn't come out really well. So for stuff like that, we'll use pressing aids. So this is um, an inert material that's used as a hard surface to help press the mus. So an example of that would be rice holes. Um, there's also different, um, sorry, there's also enzymes that we can add to it that prevent pectic hazing from forming in wines. Um, some enzymes will also help increase the yields of juice. Um, but yeah, examples of grapes that have these problems would be muscats, for sure. Uh, Riesling, Sylvaner has a hard time pressing. Um, there could, there's also other things. Those are just a couple examples for you. Um, but that slimy substance I was talking about, that's uh, pectin. That's the jelly-like glue that holds plant cells together. So these varieties have high amounts of pectin in them. So you need a pectic enzyme to help break that down so you can um, extract the juice. So this is something that you would add, um, you know, if one thing that we did when we made muscat was we would actually crush and destem it first instead of sending it direct to press to help break the skins open, get it going. And then after, as it was crushing and destemming into the bin, we would add the enzyme. So that way it would incorporate, have time to sit, maybe let it sit for like 30 minutes, an hour, and then we would send it to press. And that would be enough to help kind of get the party started so we could start extracting some juice. So that's just an example for you guys. Okay, must or grape freezing. So yeah, moving out of the equipment and to um, you know, more processes straight to the grapes. So this is a very interesting process. It's, it's done before fermentation, but it causes the berry skin cells to burst because the water expands when it's frozen. So water has, um, you know, a higher freezing point than liquid sugar. So, and most of our cells are composed of water. So that's what's happening here. 
Um, and during this time, they'll use dry ice, which is just frozen carbon dioxide. Uh, it's used to blanket the must and prevent oxidation. Uh, you don't want oxidation because it's going to turn your white wine brown. So that's basically what we're trying to prevent with that. Uh, the resulting wines will have higher tannin and higher anthocyanins. Um, also, it's a very expensive procedure and very little research available on the subject. So it's very new. Um, not a lot of people do it, but if you see it now, you kind of know a little more about it. But just like imagine harvesting, you know, 20 tons of grapes, so at least 10 macro bins, finding a room that's capable of having the energy to freeze that entire bin it's a lot of work, and it's a lot of money. So, you know, very interesting if it becomes, you know, commonly held and done, then I'll be very surprised, but it's something something to learn. Um, so anthocyanins, if you don't know what those are, that is a type of plant pigment. It's found in many foods and flowers. It's what gives red wine its color. Uh, it's also associated with antioxidants and color stability. Uh, and red and red wine especially, and antioxidants. If you weren't aware, help fight free radicals. They're anti-inflammatory, antiviral, and also anti-cancer. So this is why um, you might have read or seen articles of people talking about drink a glass of red wine every night. It's really good for you. You know, goes um, helps prevent cardiovascular disease, helps prevent cancer, all these wonderful things. It keeps you young. It, whatever, um, but. Yeah, there's a lot of health benefits to it. It's found in a lot of other foods like pomegranate, blueberries, uh, other superfoods. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot behind that. But overall, the class of compounds is really complex. If you're a chemistry nerd and you want to get into it, anthocyanins and phenolics and tannins, definitely look into it. It's pretty interesting. Lots of research going into that right now. Um, but, yeah, it's pretty cool. So these are also um, compounds that are present in flowers, too if you didn't know. So um, cyanidin is the compound that gives dark red and pink colors. Um, pil pil pilargonidin, I'm not super familiar with that one, is bright red and orange, and delphinidin, uh, you think of delphi or dolphin, as uh, blue and violet. So very beautiful. And all of these, these structures are all extremely similar, the same class of compounds. So you can see they're just missing um, one component. So this only has one uh, hydroxide group on it, or hydroxyl. This one has two, and this one has three. That's kind of interesting. This is a lighter color, goes to a darker, and even darker color. So you can see all the, you know, the attachments here. Just one small change in the composition of this compound completely changes how we see something. So it's pretty amazing. So yeah, enough on chemistry. Let's get back on subject. Okay, next is uh, cryo extraction and cryo concentration. So um, think of freezing. It's more freezing, but instead of freezing whole berries this time, we're going to freeze a tank. So uh, if you've ever left non-fat milk in a fridge that's too cold for too long, it'll actually freeze. You take it out of the fridge and it has this like really gross chunk of ice in the center. That's actually the water that's in the non-fat milk that's left behind. Because again, the freezing point is um, higher than everything else that's left in there. So it's the same concept. Basically, if you have a tank of juice that it does not have enough sugar in it, you can actually freeze it. The ice that's left behind will be water, and then you can strain the juice off. And this is also really similar to if you left, if you put Gatorade in the freezer <laughs> as a kid. You know, it's really hot outside. You want a Gatorade, but you want like a slushy, right? So you put Gatorade in the freezer, you pull it out, and as it starts to melt, you take a sip, and it's just, like, way too strong. Like, what to happen? Um, that's the same thing. The water is frozen, and everything else is left behind. So you're getting super high concentrations of whatever the heck is in Gatorade. And um, if you're into that, cool. If you're not, cool, too. Um, but, yeah, same, same concept. So it's used to concentrate... Um, juice that you might have that was affected from a rainy harvest on the grapes. So rain will actually dilute. If you harvest in the rain, it will dilute your juice, unfortunately. Uh, freezing and thawing also leads to tissue destruction if you're going to do it with the skins in there, so you have better sugar extraction. This is also a way to inhibit any spoilage bacteria that might be present on the grapes. So if you, you know, just have a horrible year for grapes and you harvest that's covered in mold and 
all sorts of yucky stuff, um, fungus. You know, you can try to recover it, put it into a tank, freeze it, shock the system, and then definitely add some sulfur dioxide. We'll talk about that later. Don't worry, we have a whole lecture on sulfites. Um, and yeah, it's pretty interesting. There's also an article here for you, for your viewing pleasure, about um, how this is a process used for um, juice separation too, commonly in the beverage market. So um, yeah, lots of different places, lots of different, sorry, um, beverage industries use these same uh, methods. So even if you decided that, you know, I don't want to be a winemaker, I want to I wanna go to Puerto Rico and I want to work at Bacardi and make rum. I've thought about it. <laughs> um, but even, you know, coffee, distillation, um, you know, ready to drink RTD and E, ready to eat and drink industries, um, you know, for iced teas and energy drinks, whatever. There's a lot of similar processes that go down. So this class is actually really applicable to many other beverage industries, which is cool. You'll find that the more you learn, you'll be like, hey, I've heard about that before. We do the same thing with wine. It's, it's very cool. It's very cool. Now, this is pretty fantastic and also a pretty crazy flex move. Uh, this is a process withering of grape berries. Uh, grapes are hung or put on a rack and it's they're dried until the desired sugar content is reached. So this is kind of the opposite of freezing. You still have the berries. You just put it in a really hot room and the water actually evaporates. The skin of the grapes actually do kind of breathe. Evaporates the water, they become dehydrated, and then you have a lot more sugar left over. Uh, this is a very time-intensive procedure. It can take anywhere between one to four months. Uh, also very expensive because you have to dedicate an entire room to looking like this, which is pretty crazy. But would be really cool to see in person. Um, but yeah, if you have a problem with ripening, it's definitely an option. Okay, another process is pre-fermentation cold soak. So uh, if anyone drinks cold brew coffee, it's the same thing. Uh, so instead of, you know, brewing your coffee in a percolator and it takes, you know, four, three minutes, four minutes to get a pot of coffee, you can actually uh, cold brew, which you take coffee grounds, twice the concentration, you leave it in the fridge overnight in a coffee filter with cold water. And I think it takes two days to brew. It's a longer process. Anyways, the resulting uh, coffee is said to be less bitter and less acidic, which is fantastic because it's the same result for grapes too. So pre-fermentation cold soak, excuse my virus threat protection interrupting. <laughs> so pre-fermentation pre cold soak is taking the must and you crush and destem it and you leave it in a tank or in a bin in a very cold room or chill the tank and then you just leave it. You just leave it for a couple of days. It's a way to um, enhance the extraction of color and flavor from the grape skins. Can bring out beneficial and different aromas um, than those extracted during fermentation. It minimizes bitterness and lowers acidity, just like we talked about with the cold brew too. So if you would like to read some coffees on cold brew and, um, and cold soaking effects on grapes, I have those for you if, if you're interested in that. Um, but yeah, it's a very interesting process. And something also to think about um, if you are a chemistry nerd is that the ex so when the must comes in and you have all these crushed grapes in the juice, you have an aqueous uh, solution, your sugar aqueous based solution. So think about how the extraction in that solution is going to be different based compared to much later in the fermentation when it's mostly alcohol, you know, 14, 15% alcohol in water as well. Um, and how that's a solvent, how that's going to change what flavors and aromas are extracted. So definitely different um, solutions. So you're going to get um, different aromas and flavors. So for all the chemistry nerds out there. Okay, so here's some um, data on pre-fermentation pre cold soak just to um, give you guys some, you know, some information on it. So this was an uh, experiment done on Stein and Blanc. So the, there's a control, there's a fermentation on the skins, and then there's um, skin contact before fermentation, so that's the cold soak. This map, if you've ever seen it before, is called a PCA map. Don't worry about it. Um, it's nothing crazy. Basically, um, what they do is you taste a wine, and um, or 
you taste the wine to taste the control, right? And then you'll, or you'll think of flavors and aromas that are typically connected to that variety and you place it on the map. And then on the axes, so zero is neutral. So these axes are actually a little bit different than you might be used to. It's like your radar. So um, zero would be here, you know, and then these wines are rated based off of their intensity. So, you know, the, and it gets, it gets kind of grouped together. It's kind of hard to explain. I don't want you to get too wrapped up into the chart. I just basically want you to see the results of the experiment here. Um, so control is in red here. So all three of the control trials had, you know, banana, pineapple, passion fruit flavors to it. Fermentation. Um, so that's control would be just fermenting the juice, not on the skins, right? Okay, cool. Uh, fermentation on skins. It becomes FOS, this guy over here. Okay, we get dry grass, astringent, raisin, honey, bitter. So, you know, the bitterness from fermenting on the skins definitely makes sense. Um, dry grass, you're going to get that earthiness um, and that green character from the seeds. Astring astringency definitely makes sense. Um, and then we have skin contact before fermentation, which is up here in this sector over here and so all the three wines scored very closely together and they all had similar um aspect yellow apple cooked vegetable which i'm not really sure if that's good or not but stone fruit dried fruit stone fruit's nice um so you can definitely see that the evolution of flavors just based off of this one decision so you know if these are all the different you can get these different outcomes just from making this one de decision imagine how many different outcomes can come through all the other choices in a fermentation? We haven't even started, you know, fermentation when this decision happens. Imagine everything else that could possibly go down. So that's the, that's the mental strain that a winemaker holds for sure. Uh, here's another experiment. Um, this is uh, like kind of a spider web map. I like this a lot. This is used a lot for sensory analysis and study. This was done on Gewurztraminer. So we basically have control, which is green. And then we have whole cluster pressing. And then we have a 24 hour skin contact plus the enzyme. So you can see in the control, again, this uh, is rated on intensity. So um, right here in the center would be zero. And then it becomes more intense as you move out. Okay, so for green, oh, moving the chart. Hello. So for the green, for control, we get, you know, some hay, rose blossom, caramel, clove, you know, passion fruit. It's kind of getting some moderate flavors here, right? It looks like it's complex. Moderate flavors are getting some bitterness, some sourness. Okay. Whole cluster pressing is not crazy different. We get a little less body. We get uh, just slightly more apple, but when we do the 24 hour skin contact plus enzyme, it really goes off the charts with intensity here. Like floral by mouth is way extreme. You get more body, way more apple, passion fruit, clove, caramel, you know, a little bit more rose blossom. You get less hay, which I think would be way better, uh, less sour. And then bitterness is about the same. Fruity by mouth, a little bit less. So there is some sacrifice here at the cost of all of this. I think that's a pretty sweet deal. So overall, skin contact is not always a bad thing for white wines, as you can see with the Gewurztraminer. Um, so yeah, hopefully that was informative for you guys. I love these charts. I think they're really helpful. Um, and you don't have to just do flavors. You can do um, sensations too. So like uh, your taste, bitter, sour, sweet, salty umami, etc. We'll get into that with our tasting. Okay, more on cold soak. Uh, this is, the reason that we focus so much on this, because this is a super common treatment, um, so that's why there's several slides on it. Uh, so for reds, how, you, how would you do this? You would hold the must at a low temperature, like below 50 degrees, uh, before fermentation to encourage soft and slow extraction of color and flavors from grape skins. Uh, this also provides a head start on color and flavor extraction because typically red fermentations do not last that long. I want to say like two weeks, maybe three. Some of them can be shorter. Um, red fermentations do not 
take that long and therefore it doesn't give you a lot of time to extract all those flavors and colors especially if it is fast you're gonna have stuff blowing off from the co2 um so it does give you a head start it can take anywhere between three to ten days um that's really up to the winemaker personal preference there's no rule of thumb it just depends what you're working with and what you're going for it's typically done with varieties that are low in anthocyanins, so low in color. We just learned about anthocyanins, such as Pinot Noir. It's a very light red. It also enables pressing at a higher bricks level. This will also enable bloom of non-Saccharomyces yeast. Saccharomyces cerevisiae is the um, yeast that we use most commonly in winemaking. So what it's saying here, what I'm saying here, is that it will enable all of the native yeast that are present on the grapes or present in the winery in the room to start to bloom and develop flavors and aromas of their own before you inoculate it with that yeast that's just going to completely take over. So it can add complexity in that way. Uh, and this is a very prominent technique for Oregon Pinot Noir production. So if you're a big fan of Oregon Pinots, this might be a method you want to take up. Okay, perfect. I think we're going to be just just on time maybe i might have to rush okay this is a little graph from wine folly on cold soaking you know uh resulting wine more color and boldness without all the tannin i don't know about boldness wine folly isn't always 100 percent on her stuff but um her photos are really nice she does a really good job of presenting information just she needs to cite her sources please cite your sources please okay Thermovinification, uh, it's a pre-fermentation process. This will actually heat whole or crushed grapes to promote rapid extraction of colors, phenolic compounds, aka colors, from grape skins, particularly um, color compounds in gra grapes to make red wines. So again, think of tea brewing. Um, this is a high temperature for a short amount of time to really just start to pull out that red color and then um, you would facilitate the fermentation afterwards. So that would help. The reason you don't want to do this before you inoculate is because extremely high temperatures will kill your yeast. So, um, you know, you think about anything that involves yeast. You want to um, making bread or brewing beer, kombucha. There's a, there's a threshold for temperature. And the temperature that this puts the must through is way too hot for yeast. So you'll kill your yeast. So that's why it's before fermentation. Okay, consequences. Not all of these are bad. Some of these are good. This is just what happens. Um, heat denaturation of enzymes. It denatures enzymes. Uh, PPO is polyphenol oxidase. I don't expect you to remember that. Um, I would just would like you to know that the extreme heat denatures enzymes that could brown the wine. It helps increase color extraction, like we just talked about. Increases phenolics. Um, phenolics is just a fancy word that, that means it contributes to taste, color, and mouthfeel. Uh, it also alters the microbial flora, just like the denat denat denaturization of enzymes. Excuse me. Um, it makes it easier to press because you've softened up the musk um, substantially with this process, and you'll get characteristic flavor changes. So by heating it up, you could be extracting something a little bit different than um, it typically would get from a standard fermentation. So if you'd like to learn more about phenolics, there is a link. Um, that's just for your viewing pleasure. It's not required. Uh, this is just a little chart about thermal vinification setup. You would uh, take the cold must. You do high heat for a short amount of time. Then you would cool it. Um, let it macerate for 0 to 12 hours with or without enzymes. Send it to press. And then you would just ferment the juice. So it's a very, very quick extraction of color. You get your red juice, and then you just ferment from there. So it actually helps kind of save a lot of cleanup at the end. But either way, you're cleaning up. Okay, sensory changes from thermovinification. Um, again, here is our spider web chart. So this is uh, skin maceration versus thermovinification. Okay, so it was fermented on the skin for eight days, green. Or um, it was put through the thermal vinification at 87 degrees Celsius. So um, fermentation on the skin for eight days. We get some bell pepper. We're getting very little fruit here. Uh, cassis is like a black currant. 
Uh, if, if I'm thinking, if I'm correct, I'm pretty sure it's like a black current. So if, if you're um, curious about that, it's a very common descriptor in Europe. So if you see cassis, uh, that's what that is. Uh, red color, I mean, we got lots of body on the fermentation, got some bitterness, astringency, a um, little bit of smoky. But then you see with thermovinification how it completely alters this map. You get all of these berry flavors. You get way less of the vegetal green bell pepper. Some people are into it, some people are not. Just depends, again, what kind of wine you're trying to make. Less spicy, oh sorry, more spicy, we're following the red here. Less smoky, and then we get less astringent, less bitter, so you're providing a much fruitier wine with um, less of the harshness. So if you have a vineyard that has, you know, it's just giving you hell, and you have bad grapes, and it's just giving you really tough, hard wines, this might be a route that you might want to consider. And you don't always have to do the entire lot. You could do 50% of the lot and then blend and see if that improves it. And then maybe you do want some bitterness and astringency because it helps give some structure. So, you know, that's those are the things that you think about as a lot of that. So, you know, options, lots of options. If you have the equipment, utilize it. You know, it's a wonderful thing. If, some, if the owners are willing to purchase that stuff, then fantastic, you know, go for it. Um, next we have flash detente which this is just a version of thermovinification, um, and it just follows up the heated process with rapid chilling of the must under a vacuum. So it goes through that extreme heat cycle, and then it's um, chilled very rapidly, and it's put under a vacuum. This bursts the cell walls to achieve, to achieve even more extraction. So this is used to reduce green bell pepper notes in wines like Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc and Sauvignon Blanc. It can reduce uh, vegetative and grassy notes. Um, and fermentation can be done without skins after this and can easily be done in barrel. Uh, being done in barrel would be a bonus because you get more time extracting oak. So that is fantastic. It's very nice. Um, and as you can see, this matches up with the thermovinification data because bell pepper, the green bell pepper component did drop. So if this, if you had a wine that had, you know, grassy green bell pepper notes, this would be a process for you to explore. So that is that. Um, so overall, flash detente, improved color extraction, reduced extraction of seed tannins, reduces green and vegetal flavors and aromas. Thermovinification does the same thing. Uh, therefore, promotes clean, healthy, natural fermentation because you've just killed any type of negative yeast or bacteria that might be present in the wine. You basically kind of sterilized it with those extreme temperatures. Uh, a highly colored juice is rapidly cooled and pressed. Fermentation without skins. That's a, that's a dream. You don't have to worry about punch downs. It's great. Okay, and here's just an example for you guys, a picture. This is a, what typical must looks like for red wine when it comes in, and then this is Thermoflash. So as you can see, extreme dramatic difference, way, way different. Um, the color has been extracted. It's a completely different color. It looks like it's been cooked, literally has been cooked. Um, so yeah, very cool. Okay, accentuated cut edges. We're almost there. This is, this is the final push. Um, this is a method for cutting up grape skins to help extract pigments and tannins. It's a uh, method developed at Tasmania Institute of Agriculture. Significant increases in uh, pigment and tannins for sure. Shows promise for help with extraction in cultivars that are low in color. So like Pinot Noir and Grenache. I have never seen this done. Uh, I couldn't find any photos of it on the internet, which is kind of sketchy. But how it was described to me was basically putting your grape must through a blender. So if you can imagine um, that literally cutting up the skins and the seeds to help get better extraction, like a big wine smoothie. So that is a method. So if you hear about it, I told you about it. <laughs> okay, now this is one of my favorite topics, sanye. Sanye literally means um, to bleed off. So this is removal of free run juice before fermentation. Uh, so what you're doing is you're taking out some liquid, leaving the must behind. This will increase the ratio of the skins and the seed to the juice. So what you're you're getting here is basically think of, um, you know, you're brewing a cup of tea. I know, I'm sorry, tea again. Brewing a cup of tea, one tea bag and one cup, right? 
what's the difference going to be if you do this one tea bag and half a cup? That tea is going to be much stronger, right? It's going to be more flavorful. Um, it's going to be darker in color, etc. So that's kind of the idea behind Sanye. You remove some of the liquid and you keep the same amount of solids for a better extraction and a better result, okay? Um, this can be used to help against duck fermentations and to stimulate intensity without removing varietal character, uh, like the tea example. Uh, this helps enhance color, tannin, polymeric pigment, um, total phenolics. Um, yes, don't worry so much about those last two. Um, I don't want you guys to get too intimidated by the, the chemistry behind it. I just want you to know the method and why it's practical and why you would do it or why you would not do it. That's mostly what I'm aiming for in this class. Okay, 5 to 18% removal of the juice is easy. Anything above 25% is going to be really hard because you're going to get just a lot of solids and not a lot of liquid to move it around in. So it's going to be um, almost unmanageable. So um, a lot of times what, what people do with that juice that they drain off is they'll make a rosé out of it. Um, they're not always the best rosé. Sometimes it can be amazing. It just depends um, how they made it, of course, what they did to it down the road. Um, but yeah, you just another... Uh, picture from Wine Folly here about what you would do and yeah I feel like it's very helpful so you can end up with two wines you can have a red wine in the tank and then you have a rosé that you fermented um, on the side as well so it's very cool it's very practical another thing I will add really quick and I know we're over our time sorry is that um, for Sanye this can be a fantastic solution if you harvested your grapes too late um, so what happens is say you, you want to harvest your grapes at 25 bricks, right? Say you harvest it at like 28, the sugar is way too high. This is a problem because you're putting your yeast at risk of a stuck fermentation because the yeast is only designed to go to 15, 15 and a half percent alcohol and you're shooting up towards 16 or 17, say maybe. Um, so what you do is you drain off some juice dilute your must with water to bring the sugar content down because you don't want to over dilute your must because then you're going to lose flavor so you have to take out some juice concentrate the flavor add some water to lower the sugar content so you end up with theoretically the same amount of flavor as what you started with then ferment it you have a much safer much healthier fermentation and now you have more product to sell and it just ends up being better for everyone. So, anyways, that's my spiel. Um, next, we just have the review questions. So, there are two slides, 12 questions on that. Um, so, definitely look at those. It'll help you with exams. It'll help keep you on track. And um, I think that's it. If you have any questions, of course, reach out to me. Be more than happy to talk to you guys. And I hope you guys have a good rest of your night. All right. Thank you.